Hi, I'm going to talk to you about Goethe's concept of world literature. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was not the person who coined this term. Uh, it was probably his um, friend Wieland, um, and this would have happened sometime in the 1770s, but that doesn't really matter too much because nobody really talks about Wieland and world literature anymore. But Goethe and world literature if you listen to the right people, is kind of on everybody's lips. Uh, Goethe didn't coin the term, or he didn't um, start using the term until he, he was um, of advanced years. So we're looking at the years 1827, 28, 29, um, and up until his death at the age of 82 in 1832. He never developed a systematic concept of world literature. We have scattered fragments, and they're kind of cryptic. They, they have an intriguing balance of apparently being quite clear, but the deeper we delve into them, the more cryptic they become. And I think this is one of the reasons why we tend to find uh, the idea of world literature attractive today, where it's not entirely clear where the benefits and the harm of globalization lies, where globalization is giving rise to increasing sectarianism and nationalism um, and a struggle for, um, for resources and benefits and cultural identity. The, so, so these are the kind of things that um, make us, I think, want to keep talking about this slightly obscure term. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a, a rather personal and willful uh, look at uh, this idea of Weltliteratur, of world literature. And I'm going to try and dig out some of the ideas that are important for me. Because what I hope we will discover is at the heart of the comments about world literature, a tension between the universality of human life, the universality of human experience on the one hand, then on the other hand, the particularity of um, nations, the particularity of languages, of cultures, even the particularity of bodies. And Goethe, a good enlightenment man that he was, is concerned in how to balance these two out. And it's worth noting also that in his quest for balancing the universality and the particularity of human experience, um, he turns to representation, to literature, as a mediation that might allow the path um, from particularity to universality and back again, and might allow the two to be suspended in some kind of equilibrium. There is a moment in this collection of essays where something interesting happens. And I'm, I'm going to draw your attention to paragraph 22, where he makes the comment, there has for some time been talk of a universal oral literature, and rightly so, for the nations flung together by dreadful warfare, then thrown apart again, have all realized that they had absorbed many foreign elements and become conscious of new intellectual needs. What was this warfare, the dreadful warfare? Uh, Goethe is talking about the Napoleonic Wars that showed for him the harm in promoting nationalism. Goethe was out of keeping with the time in this respect. All of the young Germans, um, they, they were taking up the banner of German identity in the struggle against French imperialism, if I can put it like that. Um, but Goethe saw instead the harm that comes from it. Uh, and he preferred to cling to the idea of some form of universal experience. Um, Homi Baba, commenting on Goethe's concept of world literature, goes so far as to claim that it emerged from an experience of trauma that Goethe had while observing the Napoleonic Wars.
He even took part in the campaign in the um, early campaigns against France in um, the early 1790s, but that's a different story. Um, so we've got this central tension between universality and particularity. Universality looks something like this. If we go to paragraph three, um, in the middle he speaks of um, a universal world literature that's in the process of being constituted. And he hopes that there is an honorable role reserved for us Germans. Us Germans were always hoping that um, underneath the shadow of the French um, and the English there might still be some honorable role reserved for the Germans. <clears throat> um, paragraph five, we have the statement that poetry is the universal possession of mankind. Goethe would have used the word Menschheit, which means humankind. And further down, he states that national literature is now a rather unmeaning term. The epoch of world literature is at hand. Um, the Chinese, the Serbian, Calderon, the Nibelungen, the ancient Greeks, um, the English, the Italians, these are his points of reference. Still on the topic of universality, there are a number of ways that one might approach universality. Um, because, of course, we can only approach it. When he uses the term, term universal world literature, that in itself opens up a certain paradox, because universality is something that cannot be experienced. It can be touched upon, it can be dipped into, and, and the universality of world literature is the perfect example of this, because if you were to experience the universality of world literature, you would have to speak all languages, read all languages, um, or you would have to at least have access through translation to them. So the universal in world literature becomes something like a regulative idea. It becomes something like a guiding principle. And this principle clearly is working under the pressure of the trauma of war against the particularity of nationalism. Now, even before the experience of war, even before the Napoleonic Wars, this was a really contested idea in 18th century Germany. And we need only think of Goethe's good friend from his youth, Johann Gottfried Herder, who went to great lengths to show the harm that European politics engenders by speaking the language of universalism while playing the politics of particularism. He saw this happening in European imperialism in the way a kind of European supremacy, you could even say white supremacy, was driving world politics and world trade, and the world economy. And Herder tried to develop a political theory which was aimed at recognizing cultural difference and respecting cultural difference while at the same time recognizing and respecting the universality of human, um, of human life and of human rights. So this is where the world in world literature is coming from. And this is why Goethe talks about transcending national literatures and fostering world literature. What he's really talking about is a politics of communication. And there are a couple of really interesting passages here where he touches on something happening with communication in his day, which makes him unhappy. And I'd like to turn to that briefly now. If you look at paragraph 19, he says, but if such a world literature develops in the near future as appears inevitable with the ever increasing ease of communication, we must expect no more and no less than what it can and in fact will accomplish. So this is his framework, the ever increasing ease of communication. 
communication in Germany when Goethe was born was notoriously bad. The German postal service had only just been established by the Turn and Taxis family. Um, but to get ac across Germany on the terrible German roads was a nightmare and uh, the postal service um, took even longer than it takes today, if you can believe that. There is another comment which is worth noting. If we go two paragraphs further down, paragraph 21, where Goethe says, if this kind of world literature, as is inevitable from the ever-quickening speed of intercourse, should court shortly come into being, we must expect from it nothing more and nothing else than what it can and does perform. What's a strange statement? Okay, he's noting the ever-quickening speed of intercourse. And what can we expect from this ever-quickening speed? nothing else than what it can and does perform. When I read this, I think of Goethe's final novel, William Master's Journeyman Years, Wilhelm Meister's Wanderjahre, which he completed in 1829. And there are a set of aphorisms, maxims in the middle of this novel. And one of them, I, I, I always think of it when I read this comment on the ever-quickening speed of intercourse. And I'd like to read this entire aphorism to you. Because um, where he is agnostic about the quickening speed of intercourse in the world literature comments, he certainly is not in the novel. Listen to what um, is written here. To my mind, the greatest evil of our time, which allows nothing to come to fruition, is that each moment consumes its predecessor, each day is squandered in the next. And so we live perpetually from hand to mouth without ever producing anything. Do we not already have newspapers for each part of the day? Some clever soul could probably insert one or two more. The result is that everyone's deeds, actions, scribblings, indeed all his intentions are dragged before the public. No one is permitted to rejoice or sorrow, except to entertain all the rest. And so everything leaps from house to house, from town to town, from empire to empire, and finally from continent to continent. Always express. Have you read a better description of Facebook than that? Because I haven't. It's the discontent, the fear of the speed and the all-encompassing nature of communication. Goethe realized that as communication becomes more efficient, there is a danger that it's going to focus on the minutiae of human experience and forget its universality. And we see that happening in today's social media. So there's a double trauma here. There's the trauma of war and there's the trauma of communication. Now, Goethe's antidote is the intercourse, not necessarily in reading translations from other languages, but in communicating directly with people who have grown up in a different culture, speaking a different language. And it's really important to emphasize this because this is at the heart of what he wants with world literature. He touches on it only once in this collection, I believe. And that is in, um, in paragraph 16, where addressing the Congress of Natural Scientists in Berlin in 1828, he says, in venturing to announce a European in fact, a universal world literature, we did not mean merely to say that the different nations should get to know each other and each other's productions, for in this sense it has long since been in existence and is propagating itself and is constantly being added to. No, indeed, the matter is rather this, that the striving, living men of letters should learn to know each other and through their own inclination and similarity of tastes, find the motive for corporate action.
action, not corporate in the sense of a commercial corporation, but corporate in the sense of communal and um, coordinated. And these are, of course, men of letters that he speaks about. I say of course because although uh, he should really know better than to use um, that term, and I'm pretty sure that the German also has the gendered term, even though the word um, man in English translations from the German of this period is very often a gendered term of the word mensch, which means human being. Um, but I think that Goethe is also um, has also gendered this term, the living, striving men of letters. I say he should know better because by the time he writes this for, what, at least five decades, um, intellectuals in Germany have been talking about the need to give women a voice in literature and science in the same way that men are given it. And Goethe, in fact, um, was friends with, um, with female authors, so it's a little bit troubling that he kind of forgot that when he was talking to the natural scientists. Probably there were no women in the room. Um, but what I wanted to say here is that it's, it's um, when he talks about fair care, intercourse, he is talking about bodies. He's talking about face-to-face -face interactions. He's not talking about reading and writing. He, he talks about that with the concept of world literature, but he's really more interested in bodies interacting with one another. Because it's here in the physical, personal interaction of bodies that the contradictions between particularity and universality might be resolved. Um, <clears throat> But there's something else to note here, and this is really important, and this almost never gets mentioned when people talk about world literature. We think we know what we mean when we say the word world. In fact, the word is kind of up for grabs, and it's really worth talking about even today, what we mean by this word world. But the same thing goes for literature. When Goethe talks to the Congress of Natural Scientists in Berlin, He's not, and he uses the word literature, he's not talking about literature as we mean it when we say that word today. He's not just talking about belletristic, about fiction, about novels, plays, poetry. He's talking about what scientists call the literature. And this is really interesting because the boundary between the genres which we associate with the word literature was not there for Goethe. Literature is a representational form for inquiring into the specificity and the universality of life. And this might happen in scientific discourse, or it might happen in belletristic discourse. In fact, and at the time that Goethe wrote, um, in, during his lifetime, the number of journals devoted to literature mushroomed. They, ju they were just everywhere. But if you look at the tables of contents of any of the, jour the journals of literature, you find that belletristic, the theater, novels, they only take up, what, at the most 20%, and probably less than that, of all the articles. The bulk of the articles are science. And Goethe himself um, wanted to be a scientist. He considered himself a scientist. So by the time we've worked our way through the concept of world literature, we come to this really interesting position where world literature is about balancing universality and particularity. It's about using strategies of personal interaction to enhance this balance. And it's about understanding literature as representational strategies, representational strategies that will use all the discourses in order to, um, to uh, foster universality and particularity, a dialectic of universality and particularity in the cultural experience of human beings. And all of this in response to a trauma of war and modernity, when the speed of life and conflict based on national identity is getting 
out of control. Thank you.